Welcome to lecture 26, part one. This is on containment. This lecture is a part of a three-part series called By the Bomb's Early Light, 1945 to 1953. We'll be looking at the presidency of Harry S. Truman and the early stages of the Cold War's development in the United States. The Cold War begins as a sort of relationship that falls apart. And you have to imagine the United States um, and the Soviet Union as allies during the Cold War working together, um, not exactly uh, the greatest of friends, uh, given the history between the two countries prior. At the same time, they did cooperate to defeat an enemy. And as that uh, war comes to an end, the United States is increasingly afraid of what the Soviets might be up to. Um, uh, are there expansionist plans for world domination under communist ideology going to resume? Um, are the, you know, is the partnership between the U.S. and the Soviet Union going to continue to work out? And of course, making that difficult is the fact that uh, President Roosevelt has died and the United States has now to look to Harry Truman to continue to manage that diplomacy. In reality, the Soviets were not necessarily driven by expansion or their you know, plans for worldwide domination in the aftermath of the Cold War. Um, a lot of what drives Stalin's efforts um, in 1945 and beyond is security making sure the borders of the Soviet Union are secure from any kind of future incursions. Uh, the Soviets had suffered terribly during World War II thanks to German invasions. And another factor we have to look at is um, Stalin himself, the kind of paranoia that drove him as the leader of the Soviet Union, um, who's constantly seeing plots against himself and uh, having his enemies assassinated or having people um, imprisoned. Uh, it is an astounding uh, number when you realize that this, under Stalin, 25 million people will die in the Soviet Union. Um, and that's a huge number attributed to his leadership, his paranoia, his ruthlessness. But not necessarily in the aftermath of, the, uh, of World War II, uh, any major plans of taking over the world for communism. On the other side of things, you have to look at the Soviet perceptions of the United States. Um, Truman lacked FDR skill, so Truman appears to be less cooperative. Truman appears to be someone that's less trustworthy. Um, and from the Soviet point of view, uh, Truman comes off as a sort of scrappy guy who is just eager to really prove his prowess even though um, he doesn't actually have the, uh, the, the power, the confidence and the charm of his predecessor. Um, and you see some of the tensions began to manifest themselves immediately in the aftermath of dropping the atomic bombs on Japan. Uh, for example, the United States shuts the Soviet Union out of atomic technology um, and a role in governing atomic technology around the world. That, from the Soviet point of view, appears as if this, the U.S. wants to monopolize this fantastic new weapon, a weapon that Truman um, flaunted at the Potsdam Conference um, specifically not only to warn the Japanese of their prompt and utter destruction, but also to warn um, Stalin uh, that the United States possessed a fantastic new power, um, which Stalin actually already knew about thanks to domestic spying efforts in the United States. So from the Soviet point of view, why won't America share? Uh, why won't America allow the Soviets to have a voice in the uh, governance of atomic technology after the war? From the U.S. point of view, 
The Soviets appear untrustworthy because they had promised at the Yalta conference to allow free elections in Poland, but they don't. And this seems to indicate to American leaders, you cannot trust the Soviet Union. They will go back on their word. I like this cartoon a lot uh, as an illustration of at least the Soviet point of view. Uh, we understand the American point of view pretty easily, but from the Soviet side of things, a lot of what's driving them is history. You know, they've had two invasions in the past, uh, Napoleon 1812, Hitler, um, and now the fear is what if Western capitalists, see the dollar sign, are gearing up uh, to make life difficult for the Soviets. It's a plausible thought to them. Um, psychologists refer to these um, ideas that we see in each other that are a reflection of our own beliefs, mirror image perceptions. And in many ways, the Soviets and the US mirror each other in their assumptions about each other's motives. Look at Truman's eyes. Kind of looks crazy. So here are those mirror image perceptions. The Soviet Union sees the United States as this clamoring, controlling giant reaching across the world. But on the other side, the United States see the Soviet bear in the same way. So they see in each other the thing that they're afraid of. But it also reflects their own um, values and points of view. Of course, heightening all of these tensions to a greater degree than ever would be uh, before is bomb technology, the atomic bomb, with a fantastic new weapon, the destroyer of worlds. Um, this creates a great deal of concern about the potential for a falling out um, after the end of World War II. It raises the stakes of the game. The United States develops a policy of containing the Soviet Union after uh, the initial stages of the Cold War beginning. The ideas of containment are traced to this guy right here, George Kennan, who's a diplomat to the Soviet Union, um, had studied Soviet history, understood Soviet culture, um, and he wrote a, famously a long telegram explaining what he thought the Soviets were up to. Tracing through Soviet history, this relentless expansionism, he saw that the future would also continue that trend and communism would accelerate its demand for more and more property around the globe. So in his mind, the United States needed to contain the communist. This is anti-communist Tupperware, almost, if you want to think of it that way. We will trap the Soviets in their borders and communism will not be able to go anywhere. In some ways, George Kennan's um, image of what the Soviet Union is all about actually also reflects uh, what the United States was about. If you think about manifest destiny and imperialism, this relentless drive to expand also describes America. A good illustration of where the Soviets might be aiming to take over next was Greece. In 1947, the Greeks are in a civil war um, and the United States was fearing that the Soviets were backing a communist plot to make Greece communist. Oh no, we'll have communist baklava. So we can't have that, obviously. And President Truman uh, makes a plea to the United States Congress for $400 million to help the Greeks and the Turks fight off this communist expansion. The $400 million would support uh, Greek fighters for freedom. And Truman announced in the speech that that would be the United States' policy from here on out. We will help free people resist aggression. So we won't fight their fights for them, but if they're free, we will help them continue to be free. Notice how that fits in with America's uh, longstanding commitment to democracy. This is almost Wilsonian. 
as when he announces uh, for World War I that the U.S. is going to make the world safe for democracy, for free people. In order to make sure the United States is ready to make containment a policy, the National Security Act reorganize, reorganizes our defense um, and war preparation abilities. Um, it organizes a Department of Defense out of war and Navy and Army into one single uh, grouping. Everybody is together on the same page. Uh, creates the National Security Council and the CIA, whose first director was a guy named Roscoe Hillencooter. Really cool name. Continuing on our theme of containing communism is the Marshall Plan of 1947. Um, the United States would aid in the economic rebuilding of Europe because countries who were damaged by World War, World War II, apparently not easy to say, uh, would be tempted to become communist. Their economic circumstances would be bad. Communists would come in and whisper sweet nothings in their ears and they'd go, oh yeah, communism sounds great. So if the U.S. could support those countries by giving them aid and help them rebuild, they would not become communists. They would become capitalists and the U.S. would retain friends. In fact, that's what Stalin accused the United States of doing. He said the U.S. was buying friends in Europe with uh, American money. Of course, then he promptly turned around and created his own version of the Marshall Plan, the Molotov Plan, in which they do the same thing. A great illustration of where the United States and the Soviet Union would actually clash uh, for real in terms of a physical conflict would be Berlin, 1948 to 49. So the Cold War is heating up slightly, if you can accept that metaphor for a moment. We have to remember that after World War II, Germany is divided into four zones, occupied zones, um, out of a fear that a united Germany would simply remilitarize and again try to take over the world. I mean, they've done it once before in World War I, did in World War II. We don't want a World War III. World War III. So the, the Soviet part of Germany is where Berlin is located. Berlin is also divided into four. And the United States, uh, Britain, and France would have to drive through the Soviet-occupied part of Germany to get to their part of Berlin. The Soviets decide that they want to make Berlin all theirs. And uh, in the process of doing so, they cut off land access to Berlin. The United States has to figure out, what are we going to do about this? Uh, do we risk an open conflict? Um, do we simply let the Soviets take all of Berlin? And the solution is the United States will airlift supplies to Berlin for 321 days, and that will prevent the Soviets from taking the entire city. Um, so we outflank them um, with this clever plan uh, known as Operation Vittles. And instead of actually going to war or an, an open conflict, it's sort of like a chess game, um, so to speak, with the U.S. achieving the winning move here. So you can see a map of Germany split into four parts. You can see the capital Berlin that's also split here. Um, recall that these parts here, these uh, American, Fran French, uh, British, American, French sectors, the um, will be combined into one, and then the Soviets will retain this one um, until Germany is reunified. Um, and I've referred to the whole thing as a chess move, uh, so uh, Stalin seems to be sitting on the board. Truman simply just goes around. Cartoon of Stalin attempting to block the Marshall Plan. Can he block it? Nah, he can't. Um, what does the Marshall Plan actually go for? Um, so you can see from this pie chart here, we've got raw materials, food, fuel, machines, and then of course there's always another. Every chart seems to have another. The fear of many Americans is that without the Marshall Plan, the Soviets will simply creep 
into Europe and take over. They'll exploit economic insecurity, uncertainty, and offer Europeans who are starving and hungry um, a very attractive um, offer to join the communist ranks. Um, the Soviets did create their own version of the Marshall Plan, which is being satirized in this cartoon here. Apparently, uh, this cartoonist doesn't think it works quite so well as the Marshall Plan does.